talk a little bit about the President's Climate Action Plan. Uh, very, very important to be able to measure progress. The current baseline is 2005. What is the President's Climate Action Plan? Um, it was released in June. Um, there are really three main pillars associated with the action plan. Um, the cutting of carbon pollution, cutting of CO2, that's the mitigation piece. The prior speakers in this series have really focused in on adaptation and resiliency. And then finally, really leading the international effort, the U.S. playing a leadership role. When we're talking global climate change, the global is the underlying word there. Um, we, we, we can't focus in on U.S. initiatives and U.S. initiatives only. Because the reality is, when you're dealing with a global market, for example, if you're dealing with dirty technology, let's say ships or aircraft which travel the world, the market's going to be such that if you impose regulations within a particular country, the dirty technology or equipment is going to go to another country. So a bit on the centerpiece, the 21st century transportation, mm -hmm. the most current goal for passenger cars, 2025, 54 and a half miles per gallon in terms of fuel savings, fairly substantial over the, uh, the life cycle of, uh, of an automobile. And then in terms of technologies, um, supporting renewable, renewable fuel standards and biofuels research, actually investing in infrastructure at the local level to try to generate excitement around um, um, more fuel efficient technology. Uh, the message here, uh, at least in terms of roadway vehicles, is the industry is expecting the primary growth area to be fuel cells. Maybe there isn't a future in biofuels with regards to roadway-based vehicles. But look at aviation and look at maritime. The message here in 2050, 2075 time frame, is the vast majority of those technologies will be biofuel-driven. It's very important to understand um, that, you know, the answer depends, um, most likely will depend on the particular transportation mode. Why is CO2 the focus? Why, why do we spend time on CO2? If you introduce a pulse of CO2 into the atmosphere, 300 years down the road, you still have 20% of that CO2 in the atmosphere. And 10,000 years down the road, you still have about 10%. So even if we turned off the spigot today, we still have all this CO2 that's built up, and it takes a long time for this to basically evacuate from the atmosphere. And that CO2 piece is one of the reasons why we need this multi-pronged approach to, uh, to solving the problem. So if you look at the growth from a global perspective, where is it all occurring? Now, I don't think it's a surprise that it's Asia-Pacific. Everyone knows that. But the figure I find absolutely astounding, that 62% of the growth from 2010 to 2040 is expected to occur in Asia Pacific. We, we can't solve this as the U.S. We need to solve this as, as a global economy. This is energy by uh, sector. And what I wanted to do was give you a sense for where transportation fits into the big scheme of things. So if you look over a longer period of time, the staying power is with CO2. So that's, that's one major message. As transportation professionals working towards solutions in transportation, we are working towards a big chunk of the problem. That's, that's the number two message. In particulate matter, if you look in terms of health impacts, research has shown PM is probably the major contributor from a health impact standpoint across all of the transportation pollutants. We tend to use a very dirty fuel, uh, and that's why PM is so high for maritimes. So back to CAFE for a bit, in essence, those standards are driving huge savings in fuel. So that translates directly to dollars and also savings from the standpoint of um, climate impact. So this is, this is CO2 directly tied. This gives you a sense for how important oil is to the transportation sector. 72% of the typical barrel of oil goes straight to the transportation sector. The bulk of that is passenger vehicles. A bit on aviation CO2. ICAO recently agreed to a uh, CO2 metric uh, for certification. So very much like you see mile per gallon standards for automobiles, there, there will be a CO2 measure um, associated with uh, individual aircraft engine combinations um, in the very near future. The metric's been agreed to, and we're working through the cost-benefit analysis as we speak. And one might ask, 
well, what, what's this line here, this 2% fuel efficiency aspirational goal? The ICAO member states said, well, what do we think we can accomplish? Well, one of the goals was 2% efficiency per annum. Um, well, we're obviously not quite there. Now, on the operational side, that's a kind of a tough thing um, because, frankly, you're capped. I mean, you can do wind-optimized routing, more direct routing, but you can only pick up so much there. Maybe more investment on the technology side can increase that wedge, but getting to that 2% fuel efficiency uh, goal is going to be quite a challenge. The other key international measure is carbon neutral growth. Uh, in 2020, we don't quite know what the fuel usage will be. So we've added one additional measure or one additional lever, and that's alternative fuels. Right. There's a lot of research uh, going on in that area. But if we look strictly at state member state targets, so what, what do the, the individual countries feel is going to be available in terms of alternative fuels in 2050? We feel we can fill about 25% of this gap. Uh, that still leaves a, a pretty large gap in terms of uh, fuel needs. Um, just to put that in context, that gap is about, about six times what we currently use today. That, the industry starts to scratch its head and says, uh, what's, what about that fourth lever, the market-based measures? And some of the most recent activity, at least within uh, the aviation front, is on MBMs. You, you might expect the airline industry to step back and say, we don't want an MBM. But in fact, they said, let's get out in front of it, because right now, there are several countries that already have schemes in place, carbon trading schemes in place. So I've got to report this way in Europe. I've got to report this way in Australia. The uncertainty is not a good thing for the industry. So the industry came forward in the spring and said, we would like a global scheme. The focus will be international aviation. Um, how we define that still needs to be worked through. Um, but ultimately, the expectation is there will be a, a hard decision for implementation in the 2020 time frame. How do we define international? How do we attribute fuel to a particular country? Is it the entire flight from point A to B? If you've got a flight from London to New York, is it 50-50 London? Is it cut out strictly at the boundaries? Those are the kind of details that... Um, you know, we're going to be spending the next two and a half, three years on. But this could be a blueprint. This could be a roadmap um, for um, carbon trading and um, um, reducing that CO2 gap that uh, could be used for, 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 other, um, for other modes. I think, you know, the one that comes immediately to mind that, that parallels aviation very closely is the maritime mode.